Hey, welcome to Life Church, wherever you're joining us from today. Man, we are so glad that you're here. She's Kim. I'm Mikhail. We get to be a couple of your pastors here. And we want you to know that you are not here by accident, but we believe that God has something special for you today. And speaking of special, something special that you get to be a part of when you join and attend Life Church is you get to be a part of a global church family with people meeting from all over the world. Yeah, when she says global church family, we mean it in every context of the word imaginable. So Kim, check this out. Just my last 24 hours, okay, I've gotten to talk with some of you from Argentina and Spain and the Philippines and Nigeria and Kenya. I don't know how we do all these things, but God multiplies and he makes it happen, all right? Time zones. But here's what's so cool. It is all those time zones that are represented under one church and there's literally no other time in history where we could do this together. And that is so cool to do it alongside you. Hey, wherever you're joining us from right now, we wanna know a little bit about you too. And it's so easy to do that. Go to life.church slash hello. Give us just enough information to be in touch with you. We wanna hear a little of your story and where you're coming from today. That's right. And you can also put it on the chat where you're joining us from and as you're getting that form filled out uh, we're about to go into a time of worship but before we do that here in a couple of minutes we are going to get to watch a powerful message where we're be we've been talking about the different promises that God has for us but right now we're going to go and worship God with our voices and what I want to remind you of is we worship a God who meets us right where we are with yeah. our pain um, with our burdens with our joyful moments and that's the God that we get to worship so stand up to your your feet, lift up our hands, and let's give God the praise that He deserves. Well, good afternoon, Life Church. We are so glad that all of you are here to worship with us today. We worship God because He is faithful, because He is true, because He is worthy of our praise. So, church, let's sing this together. Let's give Him praise today. He shines every idol, and He reigns with our eyes. Jehovah Jireh meets your need. 
for each and every one of us to be a part of the story that he's writing. And when we choose Jesus, our story becomes a part of his. You have a story to tell. And in the song we're about to sing, there's a line that says, there's a song of praise that only I can bring. And I love that because there is power in your story. So bring that today, whatever your story is. And I pray that it's one, I pray that it's a song of faith. Your story has a sound and I pray that it's a sound of one that's devoted in worship to our God and to the name of Jesus. It's a sweet sound. And maybe yours is a sound of redemption. Maybe yours is a song of healing. Maybe the sound of your life is one of freedom or it's a song of one that has overcome the hardest of circumstances by the grace of God, but it's yours to sing as an offering of worship. And so that's the invitation that we have today. And I invite you to bring it to him. Exaltation, and I was born to lift the name above all names. You hear the melody of all creation, but there's a song of praise that only I can bring. Who else is worthy?
with Jesus. Your story matters to him, so let it be a sound of praise, of overcoming anything this world brings. We can sing. Come on.
Want to hear more? Just say, hey Siri, play live church worship. Hey, welcome to Life Church. If this is your first time joining us, we are one church that meets in many locations, including every single country around the world. So wherever you're joining us from right now, we are so glad that you're with us here today. I'm Kim, this is Michael, and we get to be some of your pastors here. And we really want you to hear this. We are truly just so thankful and excited that you are with yeah. us today. And what I want you to know is that here at Life Church, our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And we believe that every single one of us, we have a next step. And last week, we got to watch so many people so take many. their next oh, step gosh, through so baptism. Cool. Check out this video. Hey, I think we have some celebrating to do today. Is anybody in the mood to give God some praise? No. It is a promise that you are the one Jesus loves. Our victory was earned in death's grip. There is no suffering he cannot heal, no loss he cannot repeal. He calls us out, out of darkness. God demonstrated, showed it, displayed his love that while we were rejecting him, Jesus died for us. How cool was that? Just getting so to watch cool. so many people at different Life Church locations take that next step through baptism. Yeah, and what's cool is baptisms aren't happening just at our locations. They're happening truly around the world because we are a global church and they're yeah. happening at these things called watch parties. People doing exactly what you're doing right now, which are watching Life Church online services together, worshiping together, sharing your lives together. We have those the happening. Their home, right? Exactly, or the home or a coffee shop or wherever you find a space to meet. That's where watch parties are happening and they are Life Church. You are Life Church. So, hey, we've got watch parties meeting, get this, in a community center in Italy wow. and a retirement home in Tulsa and even a movie theater in Ontario, Canada. How cool is That's that? So, awesome. so, hey, to our watch party leaders, man, thank you. You are some of the most hospitable and loving people that I've ever gotten to know. And, hey, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, I'm hospitable and loving too. Well, maybe God's calling you to start a watch party as well. Maybe he's calling you to be Life Church where you Today's are. Today's the day. Today yes. might be that yes. day. So if God is stirring that in your heart, let us know about it. There's a number here. That's actually my phone number. Text it. Text me. Blow yes, up right my now. phone. We want to know about it. Give me a chance to connect with you. Hear what God is doing in your heart and let us go from there. And I need to do one more thank you before we go on. Thank you so much to those of you who generously give. See, you make baptisms possible and you make watch parties possible and everything that happens here is because of your generosity. So thank you so much for those of you who give. Yeah, God is truly using you. And what we always say is that the best and easiest way to give is through the Life Church app. So you can go take a couple of minutes, set up your recurring giving um, in the app and watch as God uses that to make a difference. Yeah, God promises to use that and yes. use us to make a difference. Yes, always. And speaking of, he promises. We're in part three of a series called He Promises. And today we're talking about all the ways that God promises to be with us all the time. So let's go to part three of He Promises now. Hey, Life Church fam, before we dive into the word today, we're in a message series called He Promises. And we're looking at the promises of Jesus. How many of you right now have a lot going on in your life and almost like too much? Raise your hands. Okay, good news for you. Next week, we're looking at the promise of Jesus that Jesus will give you peace. Not just any peace, but he'll give you his peace. And I can't wait to share God's word with you next week. Today, though, I'm inviting one of my best friends. He's been on staff for 26 years. He oversees all 45 Life Church locations. Would you please help me welcome Pastor Sam Roberts. All right, all right. Hello, Life Church, all of our locations. Man, it is so great to be here this weekend and to get to fill in. As Pastor Craig said, 
I'm super excited about next week when he's going to be back talking about when Jesus promises us, promises us peace. Such an important, important message. I know you'll want to be here for it. Today, we are actually going to be talking about Jesus has promised to be with you. And I'll say this, uh, I have been with Pastor Craig, as he mentioned, for 26 years. And I'll tell you what, there's nobody realer. There's nobody more spiritually in tune, more love in his family, and more love with Jesus than our senior pastor. And I love him and honor him in this time. And it's an honor to get to be here and share God's word with you today. As I mentioned, we were talking about Jesus being with you. Our uh, text actually comes from something known as the Great Commission. This is actually given in the very end of the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20. And if you've never seen it, it goes like this. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Doesn't that just sound good? When somebody says, I'm with you, I got you, I got your back, but Jesus says, I'll be with you. It's just comforting, right? It feels nice. And Jesus had proven his power many times before to his disciples, and before this verse pops up. And, and we're going to talk today about the time he doesn't just display his power, but his presence in being with the disciples. And today we'll look at a story that comes out of the book of Mark chapter four. If you want to follow along in your version Bible app or in your Bibles, you can turn there. And uh, for those of you who want to study a little deeper and look at the story it actually gets paralleled in Luke eight and Matthew eight. So we can look at that. And this story is going to occur in a boat on the sea. And since we're going to be talking about a boat on the sea and I'm speaking, I'm just going to show you a shameless video of my second daughter, Hannah, when I took her out. Now, here's context, though. See, she was going to be getting married pretty soon, and she wanted to go with Daddy on the lake. And so, of course, I'm taking her out to the lake. And she then asked if she could drive the boat. I don't normally let that happen, but I let her drive the boat. I took her to the back of the lake, and I said, let's go, honey. Here's how you do it. So take a look at her driving this boat right here. Here she goes. We are skimming across that lake at about 55 miles an hour right there. Look how joyous she is. She's Now, what she said right there is, how do I slow down? That's what she said, because we're going pretty fast right there. And uh, man, I just love that girl, little Hannah. I don't have any really good reason to show you that video other than I'm up here speaking. We're talking about a boat, and so why not show you a cute video of my daughter? Back to Jesus, Mark 4. Where are we in the context of this story? Well, we're actually on a lake called the Sea of Galilee. And I want to show it to you just for to bring you a little bit of context about this sea. This sea is actually 13 miles long, eight miles wide. Okay, so it's a pretty big, pretty big lake. It's also the lowest freshwater body on earth. Okay, I mean, some of you might be like, what about the Dead Sea? Dead Sea is salt, right? This is freshwater and it's the lowest, but it's surrounded by mountains all around it, which what happens is sometimes the cool air will come down out of those mountains, hitting those warm waters and create very explosive thunderstorms on this sea. And so it's very well known for its very erratic and explosive nature. Sometimes these waves can get up to high as 10, 12 feet and have been recorded at 20 feet. So these storms are pretty crazy. Now, I'll also look over here. We are, this story, when we start, we're over in Capernaum. And we're going to be going over to Gergesa, where we're going to be headed. And in the context of all that, we get a little problem. But before we get to the problem, I think it's very important that you understand the context of what is going on, because it will help deepen what exactly happens here with Jesus. So we're over in Capernaum. Jesus is teaching, okay? And all of a sudden, a lot of people start flooding around to try to hear him teach, okay? They want to hear so many people that they put him in a boat and they push him out a little ways from shore so that he can teach. And in this context, he teaches a parable known as the parable of the sower. And in this parable, what happens is he says a sower goes out and spreads seed. Some of it falls along on a path and the birds of the air come and grab it and leave. Some of it 
falls on shallow soil and it sprouts up, but the root's not deep and the sun comes up and then all of a sudden it dies. Some of it actually lands in decent soil, but then the thorns come up. It's these worries of the world and it just chokes the seed, the seed out. But then others, he says, it falls on good soil and it actually produces a harvest, sometimes 30, 60, 100 fold. It's great. And everybody is around like, that's so good. That's good, Pastor. You keep going. That's good teaching right there. And then the disciples pull off side and be like, hey, uh, <clears throat> that was really good what you said, but uh, we don't understand it. What did that even mean? I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, okay, here's what it is. And he tells them that, listen, the seed that fell on the path, I think it's taken away. It's like when your enemy, Satan, he comes and he steals the word. But then that soil that it, where it fell in shallow soil, that's like you receive the word, but then it doesn't have root. And so when persecution comes, ah, it fades away real quick. Now to that other seed, when it hit that good soil, but then it got choked out, that's the worries of this life choking out the word that God had put in your heart. Then the one that falls on good soil is when it's heard, it's put into practice and it yields 30, 60, 100 fold. So he tells this parable to them and they're all like, got it. That's really good. And then immediately he shares with them three other parables real quickly. And first one is about a parable about a lamp. And he says, look, you don't take a lamp and then hide it, do you? No, we don't put it under a bed or under a bushel. We stick it on a lamp stand to give light to the whole house. Then he talks about a parable of a growing seed and a parable of a mustard seed. So you could say it was like a college course and he was the professor and he had been teaching, but now it was time for the lab, the time to put all this teaching into practice. And so in Mark four in verse 35, we read this where Jesus says, then that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. Now, remember we're at the sea of Galilee. We are on a seashore and we're in Capernaum and we need to go across to Gergesa, right? There's a few problems with this statement. First of all, I want you to understand it said that evening. So this is like, I'm teaching you something. And then you, when you leave church, you know, Pastor Craig taught you something really good. And you're like, oh, that's good. I need to be more like that. And then you go out and you went to the restaurant and it's like, bam, you got hit with it. And you're like, I don't know. Okay. Uh, am I going to do what he said? Am I going to put this Bible word into, pass, into practice and do it? That's what's happening to him. He says, let's go to the other side. Understand this. The sea itself, I just told you, was known for its explosive storms. Okay. It says that it was evening. In this context, it's going to mean late afternoon headed towards sunset. So they're like, mm, I don't know. Is this the best idea? But there's a bigger problem. Okay. We're over in Galilee. This is Jewish territory. It's all good. Gergesa? That's in the region of the Decapolis. It's pagan. It's Roman. It's bad. You can actually be unclean over there. This is not a good place to go. Mama said I'd never supposed to go over there. I am not supposed to go over there. This could be a big problem. And uh, furthermore, they believed that the Roman gods would many times wage war out there to try to explain these storms. They thought that Baal and Yam were out there just fighting and it creates all these storms. They thought Leviathan lived in this lake. So they were scared of this. Now, I can't imagine that there wasn't some side eyeing going on between the disciples. Like, I don't know about this. I mean, that teaching was pretty good and the sower and all that stuff, but oh my gosh, this looks pretty bad. This looks not good at all. And what we see is actually in the very next verse, he's going to teach something very amazing. But what you see is him saying, no, we're going to go to the other side. What is he doing? He had just told them, listen, you don't hide a lamp, do you? You actually let its light shine. I just told you that, but now we're going to go over there where you don't want to go to the people you don't think we need to go to. And I'm going to take you over there and we're going to go. So he's putting into practice the teaching immediately that he's given to them. In verse 36, he says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. How was Jesus? Well, quite honestly, he'd been teaching all day long to thousands of people. He was tired. He'd been healing, he'd been praying, he'd been talking, he'd been healing, he'd been praying, he'd been talking, then he'd been explaining to the disciples what he was saying. He was tired. And you notice something, they obeyed him. They jumped in the boat. 
So far, so good. The disciples are doing okay. They didn't argue with him. They just get in the boat. Despite the fact mama said, don't go over there. Despite the fact I'm not supposed to go to this whole area, I'm going to go ahead and get in the boat with him. And then in verse 36, 37, it says, they were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now listen, guys, here's the first thing that stands out to me when I read that. They did what Jesus asked them to do. They got into the boat. And yet the storm showed up. You ever feel like, I'm doing all the things. I'm not supposed to have storms. I served, I tithed, I gave. I did all the stuff. Why is there a storm? Why am I in trouble? Maybe you're not in trouble. You see, God sometimes actually will help take you into the storm, not to discipline you, but to disciple you. I don't know about you, but my life is most forged in the storms than in tranquility. The faith that I have deepens in the context of a storm. And here are the disciples in the middle of a storm. And what happens? Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. I told you he was tired. He's very tired. It's not that he didn't care. He was just wore out. He was exhausted. The disciples woke him and they said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? You said get in the boat, got in the boat. You said do that, I did this. You did the little lamp thing and I believed it and now we're going over here where mama said don't go. I did everything you said to do. Don't you care that we're about to drown? Maybe some of you today feel a little bit like that. Like, Jesus, don't you care? Uh, don't you care my kid is sick? D don't you care that my marriage is falling apart? My friends deserted me. I ain't got money. I feel alone. I want to give up. My loved one died. I lost my job. Don't you care? Don't you care? Of course he cares. You see, he was always with the disciples in the boat. He's never not in your boat. You are not alone in your struggle. They were just taught the parable. Remember of the sower? You remember that part about the word being received and then the thorns growing up? They were in the thick of it. These waves were the, these waves, this, this storm, it was the thorns. And uh, all of a sudden, the worries of this life had gotten the disciples. Don't you care? What's going on? Storms are going to come in life. You may be surprised when they come, how they come, and where they come from. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, the storms are going to come, and you cannot prevent them. The good news is, though, that Jesus is always in your boat, and he is always going to be with you in the struggle. So continuing on in this verse, verse 39, it says, he got up and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. In the matter of just a few moments, could you imagine this? You're in a boat, He's asleep on a cushion. You go down. Don't you care? He gets up. Shh. And it just gets quiet. In a matter of moments, the disciples saw Jesus' humanity being fully man and that he was exhausted and couldn't even stay awake in the context of the storm, that tired. But then they saw his divinity and the fact that he was sovereign over even the creation and the waves and the wind. And when he would speak a word, they couldn't help but obey. They saw these two things. And then in verse 40, he said to him, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? You still have no faith. Now, I'm going to pause for a second. And every time I read that in the past, I always thought, that seemed kind of unfair. That seems a bit harsh. Be and the reason is because I completely identify with these disciples. In fact, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to 
tell you, I would have been the one first going down to the storm, the stern. The first wave that came over the boat, I'd have been like, I know, y'all all good? I'm not. I'm going down to the stern right now. I'm yanking his dang cushion out from under his head. I'm like, don't you care about this? You see that water coming in? We're supposed to be. I, I told everybody not to go anyway. Mama told me not to go to Gergesa. All the crazy Roman nonsense going on over there. You're going to make us unclean. Now, Baal and Yam are after it. Now, Leviathan's probably about to eat us up. Don't you care? I'd have been the first one down there. Like, I don't understand. And so for me, I'm like, yeah, but what do you mean disbelief? I mean, the waves are literally coming over the boat. I get tripped out in my boat with four foot waves. I can't imagine 10, 12 foot waves hitting my boat. I would have been freaked out out in the middle of this lake. And so it seemed harsh. But then I realized something. Jesus never said to them when they were in Capernaum, hey guys, let's go out in the middle and die together. That'd be great. He never said, let's just go out there and get in a real big storm and let me scare the fire out of you real quick and it will be great. He said to them, let's go to the other side. He said, let's go to the other side. No wonder he said, hey, 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 you don't believe? We're going over there. I said we were going and I can't help but think about times, and maybe you relate, where God said something to you a long time ago. He spoke something into your life and then the worries of the world came up. They started choking it out. That thing you believed for, back when you said your covenant vows, you thought it was going to be great, and then it wasn't so great. You thought you was going to have this really long road in front of you, and then the doctor came in and said something, and the worries began to choke. You thought everybody was going to be great, and you were, all your kids were going to follow Jesus, everybody was going to be good, and then it didn't happen. There's something. God had spoke. We're going to the other side. Why do you doubt? Trust me. I'm with you. And we're going to get to the other side. What is that thing that God spoke to you? We see in verse 41 that they were terrified. And they ask each other, who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this guy? Who is this? I mean, he's been teaching pretty good. He's done America or two. They're kind of like, ah, maybe, I don't know, that looked pretty good. But then I like to look at this, and it's like a moment where for the disciples, it's like their full-on belief as to who he was went from here to here. All of a sudden, they ask themselves, who is this guy that the wind and the waves have to obey him? That's insane. They're like, I don't know who is this. This is crazy. He's different. It was like the storm after the storm. Like when Jesus comes in, and starts to rearrange your life, feels like a storm after your storm. You know, the storm kind of got you there where you were like, don't you care? And then he comes in, like you rearrange and everything wasn't great. And then you're like, who is this? When he speaks and the disciples are like, oh my gosh, this guy, he's with us. Now, I'm gonna tell you about a time where Jesus was with me. In fact, he was with my whole family, in fact. And uh, recently, my, uh, one of my daughters, my youngest daughter, asked me a question. She says, why does God not do miracles anymore? And I said, well, he does. And she goes, yeah? Tell me one. And I was like, okay. And so I told her this story. And I realized I've actually never spoke this story before, never from a stage for sure. But then I realized when I was talking about this story to some staff members who I've been with 20 years, plus 20 plus years, Pastor Craig's never heard this story. Some of my kids hadn't heard this story. And I was like, why? And I'm like, because I understand that there's some of you that are gonna listen to what I'm about to say and you will think I'm crazy because it's 
insane what God did. But I want to tell you today, he's with you. And I pray that this story encourages you when you hit and you're in the middle of or you're going into a storm. I was 14 years old and I was home alone with my dad. And we were awaiting a phone call from an oncologist. The phone rang, so I left the room, made myself scarce for a few minutes. When I came back, dad was looking out our storm door into the backyard. And I walked over and dad had tears in his eyes. And I knew what was on the other side of the phone. He had cancer. Seeing tears in my dad's eyes was very interesting. For context, my dad was 6'6", 200 and none of your business, worked in a steel mill factory. He actually had a lunch pail that was 10 and he carried a Stanley thermos. Not like the OG Stanley thermos. Not this stuff that's running around today. I mean the OG one. He was big, barrel chested and steel toe boot wearing. That was my dad. And when I walked up, he just simply said, let's go fix some mower. See, the mower had been broke for a little while and I'd been out my chores for a while. And so he was like, oh, go get it fixed. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go out. So we went out into this hot summer uh, Texas day. And uh, I went out and we got up underneath the old Chinese elm tree in my backyard. And I'm start, my job was to hand him tools. So I'm handing him tools. He's laying under the mower fixing. All of a sudden I hear something up above me in a branch. And so I turn around and look, and there was a dove sitting on this branch. And I'd been dove hunting since I was a little kid uh, with my dad and my older brother. Every year we went dove hunting. So I was quite familiar with dove. I know they're a migratory game bird. They're skittish. They don't stay around. This bird was sitting like eight feet from us on a branch. But it was the appearance of the dove that really messed me up. It was white, like bright white, okay? Um, almost like unnaturally white. The few times when I had been hunting and seen a bird that appeared mostly white, or I got one, it always had red eyes, but not this bird. It had blue, like sea blue. And I said, Dad, look at this. And he gets up from under the mower and he looks up and he's like, Son, be quiet. Shh, you know, scare it away. And he stood up and he looked at it. After a minute, we kind of were like, Wow, this bird's here. We go back in the house. And then uh, the oncologist had told my dad, your chemo treatment is six weeks, two times a week uh, for six weeks long. And so my dad would get up and he would go to work. And most every day he would get up, he'd go to work. He would leave the house at 4.30 to 5 a.m. He'd go to work. Then we'd go get chemo. And then we'd go back to work. And then he would come home. On the days that he had chemo, this is what would happen. Around 4.30 or 5, when he left, he would walk out the small gate in my backyard, and that bird would fly down out of that Chinese elm tree and land on a large gate that was right there on my rock driveway. He would go and get in his truck. He would leave. He would come home. And when, after he left, that bird would fly back up in that tree. When he would come home that day at 6 p.m., that bird would fly back down and land on that gate again. He would walk by it. He would come into the house. That bird would fly back up into the tree. And this happened two times a week for six weeks. Every time. Without fail. At the end of six weeks, we were waiting on a phone call from the oncologist. But honestly, I think we all kind of knew what was going to be on the other end of that call. And sure enough, when that phone hung up, it was time to ring bells and eat steak at my house. Because the cancer had been vanquished and was gone. And that was cool. My dad walked out the back door onto our patio. And he walked over by the little gate. And so I walk out the back door and I'm standing there. And sure enough, that bird come down out of that tree and landed on that same fence. And he stood there for a second and he turns around and he walks back towards me. As my dad was walking back towards me, the bird took off. But it didn't fly back to the Chinese elm tree this time. It flew up 
and it flew around my house. One time, two times, three times. Now, I understand you think I'm crazy when I tell you this. Perhaps my eyes just lost it because it was white and there was a low cloud ceiling that day. But I'm gonna, I swear to you, it looked like that darn bird flew straight up into the darn clouds. As it circled, it just got higher and higher until I couldn't see it no more. Never saw it again. We realized Jesus was with us the whole time. And uh, you may get a dove in your storm. You may. And you may not. But you always get Jesus. He's always with you. If you're a Christ follower, do you know who's in that boat? Who's in the boat with you? Remember this little girl? Look at that face. The reason she wanted to slow down, guys, is because we're headed toward a rock dam. It's fair. 55 miles an hour straight toward a rock dam, you would ask if it's time to slow down too. But does she look worried? No, she don't look worried. It's because daddy's in the boat. I know exactly when to pull that throttle down. I know exactly what the topography of that lake looks like. I've fished it many times. I know when the bank transitions and the stuff that's under the water that she can't even see. I know everything about it. And she trusts her daddy. She knows who's in the boat with her. Jesus tells us that he's going to be with us. But he tells us something else. It's maybe even more important. Did you see it? You probably didn't. And the reason is, look, this is the verse that we started with. Take a look at this. It's the Great Commission, right? This is what's on calendars, coffee mugs, and everything. There's just one important part missing, guys, and it's the verse just before it. Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, now that you know that, therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, te teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When you place your faith in Jesus, things change. He's still the one who all authority. He's still the one who at a spoken word can heal a marriage. He's still the one who at a spoken word can break an addiction. He's still the one that at a spoken word can heal the cancer. When you place your faith in Jesus, now you realize that the one who calmed the seas can still calm the seas in your soul. And he is with you, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are with us in all storms and in all trials and in all the time, Jesus, you are with us. Today, as we're praying, as you've been listening, maybe, maybe you're going through a storm and a bit of a trial, and what you want is just that, man, that constant reminder. And you want me to pray for you just to be reminded that Jesus is in your boat and he is there for you. If you're going through a storm, I'd love to be able to pray for you. Just lift up your hand right now and say, yeah, that's me. I'm going through some stuff and I want to just a reminder. Yeah, lots of hands going up. Lord Jesus, I just pray that um, we would be reminded on the daily that you are with us. Though the waves may crash and the storm and the winds may blow, that you are with us all the while, that you're always in our boat. And I pray that we would be encouraged in that, that we would be strengthened in that truth. 
still praying today with our heads bowed and eyes closed. There's others of you who, uh, man, I, do you realize who uh, Jesus is? It says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And it's important that we understand who's in the boat. But if Jesus isn't in your boat, the storms of this life can really, really be a problem. You see, what can happen is things begin to happen. Things break apart. Storms come. And we begin to fill our boats with things that don't actually work broken relationships, addictions, substances, all sorts of things. And when we do that, we miss the mark. And the Bible says that's called sin. That sin separates us from God. But Jesus knew that this was going to be a problem. And so God sent his only son, Jesus, in our place to die in our place on the cross so that he could be with us, so that he could make us new, to be forgiven of our sin to be transformed and to be able to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Maybe today that's you. And you're here today hearing this and says, you know what I need? I need Jesus in my boat. I've been putting everything else in there, but I haven't put him in control. And I today want to say, Jesus, come in, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, give me purpose. Bring me new life. Bring me your peace and forgiveness. And if that's you today, and you say, that's what I need. I need Jesus in my boat across all of our locations. Just lift up your hands high right now and say, yes, Jesus, come in, take over. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Right here in the center section, yes. Welcome into God's family. Others of you today, right over here, welcome into God's family. Those of you at church online, just type in the chat and say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Let's all do this. Nobody prays alone in this prayer. Let's all pray with those making this decision today. Pray along with me. Pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. I give you my life. Lord Jesus, give me your peace. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Everybody says, Amen. 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 Hey, we are celebrating that decision with those of you guys who just made the biggest and best decision of your life following Jesus. Heaven is rejoicing in this moment. And what we recognize is that as you make that decision, you probably still have a lot of questions. And what we don't want you to do is to try to figure all the things alone, but we want to be able to partner with you and walk with you as you begin this journey as a follower of Christ. So will you do us a favor and take a couple of seconds and go to life.church slash free. That'll give us a chance to partner with you. Yeah. And as your church, like she said, we want to walk with you in this new season of life. And that's why we created this book. It's a 21 day journey that answers questions like, what does it even mean when I say yes to Jesus? Or how do I read the Bible? What is worship? How yeah. is worship? How do I love my yeah. community? And we would love to get a digital version of this in your inbox. So give us the opportunity to walk with you in this new life of Christ that you've experienced. That's right. That is a great tool. So make sure that you take a few seconds to fill that out. And I hope you guys have been loving this message series. It's been so good. It's been incredible. But hey, next week, it's going to be just as awesome. So make sure that you bring somebody with you as we continue on part four of He Promises, where we're going to be looking at how God promises us His peace. So make sure that you are here next week, because we know that whoever finds God. Finds life. See ya.